Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, Chapel Next broadcast for this week. And I'm Chaplain Britton Price, and I want to uh, welcome you, however you may be listening or watching, uh, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, I hope that uh, you are blessed and staying healthy, uh, and that the Lord is continuing to uh, shine in your life through the wonderful truths of the gospel. Now, our passage today, we're actually closing out our sermon series on the Psalms. Uh, it's hard to believe we've been doing this for 20 weeks, so all of it uh, in the virtual uh, virtual mode, uh, but we are now here to our final psalm, not the final psalm of the book of the psalms, but the final psalm that we'll be going through is Psalm 142. Uh, and so if you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to please stand uh, wherever you may be uh, to hear the word of the Lord. A mascal of David, when he was in the cave, a prayer. With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him, I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Let's pray. O oh, gracious God, even now we ask that you open our hearts and minds to the truth of your word. And the Lord may... Uh, our, our hearts be like that fertile soil that's ready to receive the seed, the water, and the sunshine. Uh, and may that good seed of your word that's planted in our hearts grow up and bear fruit, fruit that will last. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So Esther Sturmer, like David in our passage this morning, knows about hiding in a cave. During the German invasion of Ukraine during World War II, Esther's family, as well as five other families, hid in a cave uh, for 18 months during the German occupation. They made the best of it and, uh, under the circumstances, came to enjoy their temporary home. They would point out they had freedom within the cave. They would hide in complete darkness during the day and would come out at night to forage for food. And it wasn't until 1944, when the Russians retook that area, that they were actually able to come out of hiding. While both hid in the cave, there was one glaring difference between the, uh, the Sturmer family and David. David was alone. Desperation put both parties in the cave. Desperate, desperate is one thing. Desperate and alone is something else. The cave was not the true refuge for David, and he quickly realized it. In our lives, we look to many things to give refuge in trying times. What David learned and what I'd like to share with you uh, this morning is that things can never be things in and of themselves, material things that we set up uh, for ourselves or even sometimes experiences, so on and so forth, can never be our true refuge. For this psalm, I want to look at three things. One, the circumstances of the cave. Two, the conditions of the cave. And finally, our true refuge. The circumstances of the cave the conditions in the cave, and finally, our true refuge. But first, the circumstances of the cave. Life is hard. And because life is hard, humanity has always sought to find things, uh, uh, to search frantically for the next big thing, to find something that they can escape, some special place or experience that will alleviate the difficulty of the current time and make life just a little bit better. That's how David ended up in the cave. If you remember in your Bibles from 1 Samuel 22, that Saul was trying to kill David. It went down this way. The prophet Samuel confronted Saul because Saul was given orders by the Lord to wipe out all of the Amalekites. But Saul thought that it would be better that if he spared some of the best produce, some of the best sheep and oxen, uh, and even the king himself uh, for you know, service to the Lord. But as often is, the best of intentions, uh, the road to hell is led, is, is often paved with the best of intentions. Uh, when Samuel shows up, Saul says that he's done the will of the Lord. Uh, to which Samuel replies, well, then what's this bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen that I hear? After Saul gives his excuse, Samuel tells him that to obey is better than sacrifice. 
and that the kingdom will be torn and given to another. That another is David, and Saul wants to kill him so that his son Jonathan can rule, as opposed to David, who is not of the house of Saul. In the midst of Saul's pursuit of David, he pretends to be mentally unstable before the king of Gath so that he can escape, and when he does, he hides in the cave. Those are the circumstances that brought David into the cave. Now, I feel pretty confident in saying that there is no one listening to me now that is being pursued, that someone is trying to kill you because God has given you the throne of Israel. So how does this relate to us today? Well, a good question to ask ourselves is when trying times come, when you are in a difficult season of life, what do you turn to? What do you seek to be your refuge? The answer to that question will tell you what your heart is truly trusting in. Some of us turn to entertainment or exercise as a form of escapism from life. Others may go to a good book, vacations, retail therapy, etc. Still, some of us may turn to things a little bit more illicit, like sex or drugs. Some of us may try to numb the pain through alcohol or other type of uh, um, substances. Now, I must say that not all of those things are sinful in and of themselves. Uh, David uh, was not in sin by going into the cave. It was a viable option, but he didn't stay there because it didn't give him the refuge that he was actually looking for. And that's how it is if we put our faith in things and not in God. Some of us may even take a more dangerous approach. And you've got to listen to me carefully here because at first glance, you might not think this is very dangerous. It's easy to throw stones at those who escape into godless things like sex, drugs, or in more acceptable forms like vacation or retail therapy, right? But what do we do when we try to escape into religion? Let me explain what I mean. Crisis hits. And let's say you have, you have person snuffy over here. They decide that they need to live better because that's the reason that the crisis has happened to them. So they decide to start going to church on Sunday and Bible study on Wednesday and prayer meeting on Friday and top it off with feeding the homeless on Saturday. Now I'm all for people and for, you know, for a person snuffy over here doing those things that I just mentioned. But what, is, but what God is not for, and therefore what we cannot be about, is losing sight of who we are doing those things for. The heart of this person is just as lost as the others because they are doing it to earn God's love not doing it because they have received God's love. Said another way, they are trying to control their circumstances by controlling God. It sounds this way in counseling. I just don't get it, chaplain. I'm in church each Sunday. I pay my tithe. Why are these things happening to me? What they're really saying is that because of their activities, they feel that God owes them a good life, that God owes them a better life, a comfortable existence a path to go down the middle of the road. It's not grace. It's works righteousness. What does David do and what should we do? Of note, David was not in the cave very long. When you go back to 1 Samuel 22 and you read it, uh, he was only in the, in the cave for two verses of what we, I would call Bible time, right? But in that time, however long it was, uh, he composes a prayer, Psalm 142, and a song, Psalm 57, which is the first point of application. No matter what you're going through right now, and I'm sure some of us are going through some very trying times, especially because we've not been able to gather together as a congregation. And I would just say, as an aside, Chapel Next, I miss you. I miss you. And hang on. We will get back together as soon as we possibly can. But we can't forget our personal devotions. David was in the cave, and even though he fled into the cave to protect his life, to seek a refuge, he realized that in the cave, God was still with him. And so that God was still Lord of not just the entire created order, but even in that moment, Lord of the cave, and is still worthy of worship. Still worthy of worship. So no matter your circumstances, sing to the Lord. No matter the trying season that you are going through, wrestle with his word. Pray to him. Seek him out. This is a lament psalm. David is crying out to God. That's the point. Complaints go up. Whining goes horizontally. 
our complaints, lament, lamentation, and I've said this earlier in other psalms as it's come up, it's faithful complaining. Complaints go up. Only whining goes to the left and to the right. Now listen, this is why David cries out and he says, you know, to the Lord, in verses 1 and 2, with my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. I'm sure that David was thankful for the cave. It shielded him. It probably gave him a little bit of protection from the elements. It allowed him to hide. It gave him cover and concealment. God could have preserved David in any number of ways apart from the cave. But there's a lesson in this. Therefore, like things like working out or weekend getaway or one of the other trips or, or my pers- one of my personal things, right, is, is a trip to the bookstore, uh, which has been interrupted by COVID uh, or it can't even go to the library. Sometimes those things themselves are a gift from God and we should thank God for them. But they were never meant to be things in and of themselves. So those were the circumstances that brought David into the cave. But what were the conditions in the cave? If David was putting any of his hope in the cave, they were gone once he got in there. If you go back and you look at verse 4, what does it say? Look to the right and see, there is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. Clearly, it's not a matter of cover and concealment. He had it. Clearly, it's not a matter of safety. He had it. But yet, he was alone. That should echo back to the very beginning of the Bible when God said, it's not good that man should be alone. It's the first mention of not good in the Bible, by the way. It's not good that David was alone. David's desperation to escape from Saul put him into the cave. And in the cave, it was just him. He was alone. Have you ever seen someone who have tried to escape from life in such a way that their addictions got the best of them. Got the best of them. Whether it's the illicit addictions of, of, you know, of drugs or alcohol or sex, or even something that started off, you know, something, uh, something innocent, like, you know, retail therapy, where they end up on the show Hoarders because they have so much stuff they don't know what to do with it or that good meal, but they made a good meal an ultimate thing, and so now we have the show My 600-Pound Life. Or when I was a hospital chaplain, the the numerous folks that ended up in, in the hospital because they got rhabdo, because they were doing CrossFit so much, their body never got a chance to recover and heal. And they ended up causing some of their organs and some of their muscles and things to shut down. I had one man, it's a pitiful sight, I had one man when I was at the hospital. I walked into his room, uh, and he had lost everything because of heroin addiction. He had lost his wife, he would lost his kids, he would lost his job, and he almost lost his life. This man, when I met him, he was alone. We have to be careful about what we take refuge in. Malcolm Gladwell staff writer for the New, York, New Yorker magazine, theorizes that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything. And this is in his book, Outliers. It may be hard to calculate how long that actually is, but 10,000 hours is essentially 417 days. So that means that if you did nothing else but that one thing in 417 days, roughly yeah, about a year and a half, you'd be an expert. Now, Doing that 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 417 days is is unlikely. We need sleep, we need food, we need to relieve ourselves in the bathroom, all sorts of things that would take away from that time. Now, what would be more feasible would be an hour a day. Now, if you did an hour a day, that meant it would take 27 years to be an expert at something. Now, it might not seem very long when you consider the average lifespan is over 75 years. However, the problem comes in when you consider that you are still not guaranteed anything even if you devote that time. Just because you devote an hour a day to playing the violin does not mean you will be first chair in the Boston Pops or in a symphony orchestra. Just because I devote an hour a day into being, you know, into working on my basketball game 
I'm 5'10", I'm 200 pounds, I'm not making the NBA. No matter how much I give up an hour a day for however many years I've got left in playing basketball, it's not going to happen. Now what happens is that it becomes a, a type of slavery because we've devoted our life in this pursuit to becoming an expert in this way of trying to escape being ordinary, of just being average, of being of no account. But that's the key is that because we typically, when you have people who are pursuing those things, they're basing their identity on those things and not basing it on the God who gives the gift of time, because time is a gift, or the ability and skill. Really talented people who find their identity in those types of things, they'll say, well, at least I can fill in the blank. At least I can play basketball better than this amount of people. At least I can do these things better than the average person. But so what? So what? That does not help you in trying times. It's actually a gift from God. And so what it's doing is it's a gift from God and that's why it works. But the moment you try to make it an ultimate thing, the moment you say like, oh, I had a hard day at work, I just need to go shoot some hoops or I just need to go play the violin or I just need that, I need that drink or I need that, that cup of coffee or I just need to go order something off of Amazon or I just need to you know, do some Netflix and chill. As soon as you go to do that, it activates. It activates where God's like, oh, you're seeking the gifts and not the gift giver. So then God says, no, 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 that's not going to work for you. It's not going to give you what you want it to give you. God will ensure that it doesn't give you that. Because those things, those good things, I'm not talking about the illicit things, I'm talking about those good things because we're trying to make it an ultimate thing. God said there's only one ultimate thing in this world, and that's him. And so he makes sure that those things don't bring us the satisfaction that they normally would if we approached it with a grateful heart for the time to actually do that and allow him to bless it for our benefit. Or consider the person that I mentioned earlier who I said was in the most dangerous position that tries to flee and to escape the hardships of life into religion. That may be some of us listening or watching at this time. They're doing so much for the Lord that they lose sight of the Lord. And that no one wants to be around them because of their devotion to the Lord. And so they'll think like, well, everybody's just is forsaking me because I'm so committed to the Lord. No, it's that you've become insufferable. I mentioned CrossFit earlier. Uh, there, there's an old joke that says if... if uh, if you wonder if somebody's doing CrossFit, don't worry. Give it a few minutes, they'll tell you. Because they want you to know, hey, I do CrossFit. I do CrossFit. I got my workout of the day in. And so the religious person that flees into religious activity, again, I'm not condemning it, but we have to make sure that our heart is in the right place for it. If you start to think, if God confronted you and said, well, why should I let you into my heaven? Because it is his heaven. By the way, it's his earth as well. But let's just for the sake of the heart, say, why should I let you into my heaven? And you start going into the list of reasons why, and it has no mention of Christ. It has no mention that, because there's actually no reason why you should let me in, because I'm a sinner and I deserve your wrath. But oh, thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. If that's not the thought that comes to mind, we are placing our hopes in the wrong thing because only one thing can save you. And when we do that, when we lose sight of Jesus, the thing we sought to take refuge in becomes a prison. Notice David's words from verse 7. Bring me out of prison. He went into the cave to get shelter, to get safety from Saul. But he said it's become a prison because he's desperate, because he's alone, because it did not give him what he thought it would give him. He was no more secure in the cave than he was outside of the cave because he was alone. And so he prays to God 
bring me out of this prison. Which is why Jesus is our only true refuge. For the Christian, our refuge is a person. And this is why the woman who had the discharge of blood sought after Jesus. Everyone else had failed her. Twelve years she spent all her money on physicians. But she said to herself, if I, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I can be made whole. And she touched him. And instantly her discharge of blood dried up. And Jesus, perceiving that, the Bible said, that, that power had gone out of him, stopped and said, who touched me? And Peter tried to say, well, you know, Master, everybody's crowding in on you and, and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, and he's, and Jesus said, no, 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 power went out from me. Somebody touched me in faith. And the Bible says when she couldn't hide anymore, the crowd split. She came. When she saw she wasn't hidden, she trembled and she fell down before him and declared in the presence of Jesus and all the people why she had touched him, which would have made him ceremonially unclean, unless you're God and you can't be made unclean by anything, and how she had been immediately healed. He was the refuge for this woman. Money spent on physicians couldn't provide a refuge. Jesus could. The cave couldn't give David what he was looking for either. And whatever you or I are trusting in, apart from Christ, will not do it for us. Look back with me to verses 1 and 2. It says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. Four times, four times in two verses, David cries out, pleads for mercy, pours out his complaint, and tells the Lord his trouble. He knows that God will deliver him with or without the cave. In verse 4, he says, look to the right and see that there's none who take notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. But then for those of us that have been reading our Bibles for some time, we, Jesus tells us, don't fear the one that can kill the body and then have nothing to do with you. Don't, don't fear the one that can do that. So don't fear, hey, David, don't fear Saul, because all he, the worst he can do is kill the body. No, who you should fear is the one who can kill body and then cast your soul in hell. But the reason I bring that passage up is because he is saying no one cares for my soul. Well, the same one that has the authority to cast your soul into hell is the same one that has the power to care for your soul, to nurture your soul, to love on your soul, to reassure your soul, to put, open your heart heart and your mind to behold the beautiful truths of the gospel that even though you should rightfully be cast into hell because of our sin, because of your sin, because of my sin, we have no part, we don't deserve but anything but his wrath and curse in this life and the life to come, yet he cares for our soul. And because he cares for our soul, he will bring us out of the prisons that we most, more often than not put ourselves in. David put himself in the cave. We oftentimes put ourselves in situations because we're seeking escape. We're seeking safety. Those are not bad things. But when we make the refuge, whatever those things are, when we make them ultimate things, we've crossed a line. Our brigades had two suicides in the month of August. And I am convinced that they happen, suicide happens but because most of us are dealing with two types of trauma. Two types of trauma that we are seeking refuge from. And this may be somebody listening to me, and so I want you to listen uh, to me very carefully. Some of us feel guilt and we feel shame because of trauma that we have caused, i.e. things that we have done to someone else, maybe to ourselves, and we feel guilt and we feel shame over it. But some of us also will feel guilt and shame, not because of something we've done, but because of something that was done to us, somebody else's sin towards us. So two types of trauma. 
God, through Christ Jesus, is a refuge, is a refuge, no matter which side you're on. And some of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we're all in both camps. We've all caused some tra kind of trauma to somebody. You may not know it. You may not be aware of it. But that doesn't mean you're innocent of it. I'm sure some of our comments on social media, some of our posts on Facebook, some of our uh, comments that we put on somebody, you know, we have some of these battles, right? You know, because people, we, we think we got some Twitter muscle or Facebook muscle or Instagram muscle, right? And we're causing problems. We've caused trauma to someone. Or maybe we are on the other side of it. That's just one example. Whatever it is. Christ is a true refuge. You can flee to him. Just like the woman with the discharge of blood, it's not going to stain him. It will only make you better. It will only heal you. If you have caused trauma and you come to Christ, the Bible is littered with examples of people who acknowledge their sin. The Pharisee and the tax collector. The, the tax collector wouldn't even look up in the temple. And he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says he went home justified. Legal standing before the kingdom of God, but in the courtroom of the Almighty that you are forgiven and declared not guilty. You can be forgiven. Because Christ is your refuge. If you are suffering of the guilt and shame because of something that's been done to you, like the woman with the discharge of blood, you can go to Jesus and be made whole. Because you know what he told her? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. You don't have to go through life with this almost like a, a scarlet letter, almost like you have this, you know, like, a, like a, a tattoo of the trauma that was done to you. Lift up your eyes and see the refuge that is in Christ. David knew when he said that no one cares for my soul he knew that God would take notice of him. And in Jesus Christ, the greater David, God delivers and saved him from his slavery and sin to misery. His slavery and addiction and idolatry and delivers not just by speaking a word, but by actually going into the cave to call us out, to come out. You see, Christ... Most of us would stand at the entrance and say, hey, come on out of there. No, 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 no. Christ went into the cave. How did he go into the cave? When he hung upon the, Christ, upon the cross, he went into the cave of death. It was a cave that he was placed in that no one had ever been placed in. He went into the cave to call us out of the cave. He went into the grave to call us out of the grave. That's why. At the end of verse 7, when it says, Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully for, with me. You will deal bountifully with me. Jesus goes into the brothel to call out those in prison there. He goes into the crack house to grab his people out of there. He goes into the mall to deliver the shopaholics. He even goes into the bookstores to grab a cat like me. He shows up on your web browser to grab you out of pornography or something seemingly innocent like Amazon. He goes into the classroom and deliver those who seek refuge in academic achievement. He goes into these hospital rooms and deliver those suffering there or those trying to seek refuge through being a med have, be, having medical practice or being a doctor and having the societal, uh, you know, know, reputation of, you're a doctor, of having that title. He even goes into the chapel to deliver those who know they can't save themselves and need a savior. David felt alone, but ultimately had God to call on. Christ was abandoned on the cross by everyone, including God, so that he could pay the penalty for our sin. But that means no matter how desperate our circumstances, we know that God will hear and God will will heal. 
David came out of the cave to be surrounded by those that were loyal to him. Go back and read 1 Samuel 22. Those that were loyal to him were there when he came out of the cave. When God calls you out, you're not alone. When he calls you out of all of these things that I just mentioned, or if I didn't mention it, you're not off the hook. Wherever the Holy Spirit is kind of it's kind of pricking your heart and saying, yeah, you know, you, you're putting your little too much hope and faith in this thing. When he calls you out, you're not alone. You guess what? You're with the church because the church means the called out ones. We've all been called out of something. We've all been called out of something. Every single person in the church that places their faith in Jesus Christ has all had to walk this way. Not only at some point in the past, but daily. Daily. We have been called out of something and are constantly being called out of something. Because we are the called out ones. You're not by yourself. And in Christ, you are never alone. Christ ministers to us through his people. He does the same thing for us. In whatever individual prisons that we put ourselves in, he calls us out and surrounds us with the church. And for all eternity, we'll deal bountifully with you and with me. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you call us out and bring us out and deliver us from the prisons that we put ourselves in. Thank you, Lord, that there's not a pit so deep that you, Lord Jesus, are not deeper still. And so for those, Lord, under the sound of my voice, whatever pit or whatever refuge they've, they've put themselves in by seeking to escape, sometimes the harsh realities of their circumstances, deliver them, Lord. And show them your beauty. Remove the, uh, the affection for those types of things and replace it with a, new, a great, new and greater affection. That is you. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now receive the words of the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. Thank you.